What is the main message of the book The Science of God by Alistair McGrath? Can it be drawn? Well, we think it can. For McGrath, scientific theology is an attempt to relate theology to science. Specifically, McGrath focuses on the relation between Christian theology and the natural sciences. In this first episode of the series, we will start modeling what McGrath understands as natural sciences, and therefore scientific, in the book The Science of God. Next, in the second episode, we will present a model of what he defines as a Christian scientific theology in this context. Ready? So let's do it. McGrath's starting point to define what he means by natural sciences, and therefore scientific, is the question, what is nature? Or, what is the nature of nature? That is, if nature were represented by a universal set, what elements would belong to it? How would this set be defined? Thus, a fundamental part of the scientific theology system is an ontology of nature. To try to answer this ontological question, human beings project themselves away from nature to gain a point of view over it, that is, to observe it. However, several new questions arise in this process. Is it possible to know what nature is? That is, is it possible to move from observation to knowledge of nature? If not, why not? If so, to what extent and how? Thus, not only an ontology of nature, but also an epistemology and a corresponding methodology of natural sciences are fundamental parts of the scientific theology system. For McGrath, Several answers were given to these questions throughout history. In the Enlightenment, the epistemological answer was that it is possible to know what nature is based on reason, that is, starting deductively from a priori reasoning. Thus, the Enlightenment modernism was marked by rationalism. Its ontological answer was that Nature is a set of logically related data, a perspective that led to a methodological positivism in this period. In fact, for the Enlightenment mindset, any human being using reason, seen as universal, would infallibly define nature in a same given and logically knowable way. Clearly, a stance of rationalist foundationalism. This was reality for Enlightenment modernism. In postmodernism, this foundationalism was discredited by historical analysis, which pointed to the existence of various historically situated rationalities, and not a single universal reason. Thus, observation was considered a community reading with its corresponding inclination, that is, an interpretation with its interests, and not a neutral point of view. Therefore, nature, as a set of entities, was considered a social construct, its specific form being freely built by each community, and not objectively given to the senses and mirrored by them. This was the answer of postmodernism to the ontological question about nature. Consequently, the answer to the epistemological question of the natural sciences was that it was not possible to know what nature is, since nature does not exist outside social constructs, a typically idealistic answer. Thus, methodologically, no social construct would have to go through an external validation because this would not be possible. It would only need to be internally coherent. Therefore, postmodernism proposed as its method the deconstruction of constructs through the denouncement of the power relations considered totalitarian that lie behind the apparent coherence of each social construct. This is reality for postmodernism. 
However, in this context, how to explain the explanatory and predictive success of natural sciences? Doesn't it imply a certain correspondence between scientific constructs and external reality? And how to make sense of the processes of development and reception of social constructs by the communities? Wouldn't they also involve a community expectation of correspondence between construct and observation? In this context, philosopher Alasdair MacIntyre proposed the notion of a traditional mediated rationality. That is, on the one hand, he recognized that every observation is an interpretation, and more specifically, a traditional interpretation, done through the lenses of the ideas and practices of the respective community. On the other hand, for him, tradition does not block but mediates the rational knowledge of external reality. For McIntyre, nature exists outside social constructs, although it is not directly accessed without the mediation of tradition. However, this impossibility does not prevent traditional constructs to be considered more or less distant from what is known, although provisionally, as true knowledge about nature. Truth here used in the sense of correspondence. Thus, traditional constructs may be compared among themselves toward the abduction to the best explanation. Therefore, although historically situated, a traditional construct can carry with it pretensions to universality even if it is not universally accepted. In fact, for McIntyre, the acceptance of a traditional construct depends both on its external validity and on its internal coherence with its own tradition. Hence, constructs are developed by their communities over time, based on these criteria. Similarly, philosopher Roy Baskar proposed the so-called critical realism. Realism because it defends the independent existence of external reality, which, therefore, impels human beings, both intellectually and morally, to give an account of it. So, for Bhaskar, constructs are social responses inductively produced by reflection on the interaction with an external reality and in this way constructed after this empirical encounter. Thus, constructs are not arbitrary, since they have as their reference the interaction with reality. However, Bhaskar's realism is critical, since it recognizes a gap between social construct, given as provisional, and full knowledge of external reality. For Bhaskar, Communities seek to attain verisimilitude between their constructs and what is known of reality, incrementally overcoming the anomalies over time. Thus, Bhaskar's critical realism is not naive as if there were no gap between the construct and external reality, nor instrumentalist as if this gap was not important in practice. For McGrath, this seems to be the simplest explanation for the success of the natural sciences. Bhaskar also stated that reality is a unified whole, stratified in various irreducible ontologically interdependent levels. Consequently, he claimed that the method to obtain knowledge should be cataphysical, that is, according to the nature of the level of reality under analysis and therefore should be plural. In other words, Bhaskar stated that epistemology and methodology should follow ontology and not the opposite. In this encounter with reality, Bhaskar stated that the existence of non-observable entities should also be taken into account. These, therefore, could be hypothesized in the corresponding social constructs. Given this scenario, in the last part of the book, The Science of God, McGrath deals with several aspects of the concept of theory. Firstly, he turns back to the corresponding Greek term, theoria, 
which designated a set of teoros, the name given to officers sent by the community to observe certain events and report on what they had seen. Thus, at its origins, this notion of theory pointed to the responsibility of social constructs before their respective community traditions. Therefore, McGrath points out that theorizing has as one of its motivations the social demarcation of a community in relation to other traditions. However, besides being responsible, theories ought also to be responsive in the sense of responding faithfully to the external reality. According to McGrath, theorizing seeks this explanatory responsiveness through the modeling of reality being this process inherently a reduction of the observed complexity. This modeling is done through words, propositions and or images, and a phenomenon of one level of reality may be represented to a certain extent by analogy to similar phenomena of another level. Historically, the representation of complex phenomena often required complementarity between two or more apparently contradictory models. This unexpected form of modeling exemplifies the defamiliarization that should be sought by a theorizing process that intends to enrich the traditional interpretation in its encounter with reality. Therefore, in theorizing, it is important not to lose sight of the particularities of reality and the processes by which they develop over time. So that the theories are not bound to generic models that do not adequately respond to what is observed, this recommendation is known as the redemption of particulars. Thus, theories are always under development to better respond to reality. Moreover, McGrath claims that, in spite of necessarily involving a reduction of complexity, theoretical results imply non-reductionist discussions of reality as a whole, and may lead to revisions in worldviews. Thus, McGrath claims the legitimacy of taking into account the metaphysical realm, understood as the ultimate, non-observable reality behind nature. The possibility of the existence of this reality, rather than privileging, lays further responsibility on the social constructs that take them on, because it increases the responsiveness required of them. McGrath says that the metaphysical considerations should be made a posteriori as a form of discussion of theoretical implications and not a priori as presuppositions of the theorizing process. Metaphysics, then, does not lead to an early theoretical closure, but to a theoretical opening to the mystery of the complex coherence of reality. This is a graphic model of what McGrath seems to understand by scientific in the book The Science of God. <laughs>